This is a video in clinical medicine from the New England Journal of Medicine. The placement of umbilical catheters is an essential technique for the treatment of many newborns in unstable condition. This video will demonstrate the placement of catheters in the umbilical vein and the umbilical artery. Careful preparation, sterile technique, and attention to detail are instrumental in successful catheter placement. We will demonstrate the regional anatomy of the umbilicus, indications and contraindications for the insertion of an umbilical catheter, the recommended technique for catheter placement in both the umbilical artery and vein, selected complications associated with the procedure, and suggestions for how to avoid them, and appropriate aftercare of the catheter. Umbilical vein catheterization may be indicated for emergency vascular access, monitoring of central venous pressure, exchange transfusion, and central venous access in infants requiring long-term parenteral nutrition. Umbilical artery catheterization is indicated for frequent measurement of arterial blood gases, continuous monitoring of arterial blood pressure, angiography, and occasional resuscitation. The umbilical vein is considered the optimal vessel in this situation. The contraindications are similar for both vessels and include omphalocele, gastroschisis, omphalitis, and peritonitis. In umbilical artery catheterization, evidence of vascular compromise in the lower limbs or buttocks and necrotizing enterocolitis are considered additional relative contraindications. Within the Horton's jelly of the umbilical cord, the arteries are located lateral of midline in the inferior portion of the cord, positions 5 and 7 on the face of a clock. In a full-term infant, the artery is approximately 7 centimeters from the umbilicus to where it joins the internal iliac artery. The umbilical vein is a larger midline vessel with thinner walls, located at position 12 on the face of a clock. In a full-term infant, it is 2 to 3 centimeters in length and 4 to 5 millimeters in diameter. After the procedure has been explained and consent obtained from the parent or parents, review the records and examine the patient to confirm that there are no contraindications to catheterization. In your examination, concentrate on the anatomic landmarks. You must then decide how deeply to place each line. The umbilical artery catheter, or UAC, can be placed in a high-lying position between thoracic vertebra number 6 and 9, or in a low-lying position below the third lumbar vertebral body. Here, we will describe the procedure for the placement of each type of catheter. There are many acceptable methods for determining the appropriate depth of placement. To calculate the depth for inserting a high-lying UAC, multiply the weight in kilograms by 3 and add 9 centimeters, then measure and add the length of the stump to this value. To calculate the appropriate depth for the umbilical vein catheter, or UVC, insertion, multiply the weight in kilograms by 3 and add 9 centimeters, divide that total by 2, then add 1 centimeter. Standardized graphs for determining the depth of catheter insertion are available and they are included in the supplement. To ensure the highest level of sterility, the operator should wear a sterile gown and gloves, as well as a surgical cap, mask, and face shield. In addition to these items, most of the equipment can be found in commercially prepared kits and should include skin preparation solution, a surgical drape with central opening and or sterile towels, sterile 4x4 gauze, a three-way stopcock with a lure lock, one for each catheter port, a 5 or 10 milliliter lure lock syringe, one for each port, a number 11 blade scalpel, saline or heparinized flushing solution, straight iris scissors, three mosquito hemostats, two smooth curved iris forceps, one toothed mosquito hemostat, an umbilical tie, suture, and a needle driver. There are numerous types of umbilical catheters from which to choose. A 5 French arterial catheter should be used in infants weighing more than 1.2 kilograms, 
A 3.5 French arterial catheter should be used in infants weighing less than 1.2 kilograms. Arterial catheters should have a single hole and be as non-thrombogenic as possible. The umbilical vein catheter should be 5 French for infants weighing less than 3.5 kilograms and 8 French for infants weighing more than 3.5 kilograms. Consider using a venous catheter with side holes when the catheter will be used for exchange transfusion. Otherwise, venous catheters can be single or double lumen and should have one hole. The infant should be placed in the supine position on a radiant warmer. The infant's arms and legs should be secured to avoid movement that might contaminate the sterile field. Sedation is generally not needed because the skin is typically not cut or punctured with a needle. Make the necessary measurements to estimate the depth of catheter insertion. After you are fully scrubbed and garbed to perform the procedure, attach a stopcock to the hub of each catheter and fill the system with flushing solution. Be sure each stopcock is in the off position. Ask an assistant, who need not be wearing a sterile gown, to grasp the cord by the cord clamp and apply traction vertically. Apply antiseptic solution to the cord and surrounding skin. Apply sterile towels or surgical drape in such a way that the patient's face is visible, then wrap the cord tie around the base of the umbilicus and tie with a single knot. The knot should be tight enough to prevent bleeding from the cord, but loose enough to allow the catheters to pass through the vessels of the cord. Cut the cord horizontally with the scalpel, approximately 1.5 centimeters from the skin. Take care not to cut the skin that is at the base of the cord. Ask the assistant to remove the cut cord and clamp from the field. Identify vessels within the cord. Control any bleeding by adjusting tension on the umbilical tie and by blotting, not rubbing, the freshly cut surface. It is feasible for a single operator to place an umbilical catheter successfully. However, we will describe and demonstrate the procedure for the operator working with an assistant donning sterile attire. The assistant should use the toothed mosquito hemostat to grab the side of the cord near the artery to be cannulated and should avoid grabbing the artery. Clamp a curved hemostat to the opposite side of the cord. The assistant should apply traction to these hemostats in opposite directions to stabilize the cord. Using your non-dominant hand, place the closed or pinched tip of the curved iris forceps into the lumen of the artery to a depth of approximately 0.5 centimeters. Keep the tip closed on initial insertion and then remove the forceps. To dilate the artery further, place the closed tip of the forceps back into the artery, insert to a depth of 1 centimeter, and allow the forceps to open slowly. Leave the forceps in an open position for 20 seconds to dilate the vessel completely. Use your dominant hand to grasp the catheter one centimeter above the lumen using the other mosquito forceps, or using the thumb and forefinger, slide the catheter between the tips of the forceps within the umbilical artery. Using a firm, steady motion, pass the catheter 1.5 to 2 centimeters into the artery and remove the indwelling forceps. Grasp the cephalid portion of the cord with the toothed mosquito forceps and apply traction in the cephalid direction to assist in passing the catheter deeper. Once a depth of five centimeters has been reached, draw back on the syringe to ensure the blood is able to flow. As the catheter is passed to the predetermined depth, you may encounter resistance at the curvature of the vessel, approximately six to eight centimeters in depth. The vessel should slowly relax, not pop, as you apply constant pressure. Confirm placement with radiography or an ultrasound image. A low-lying catheter should be at lumbar vertebra 3 to 4. High-lying catheters should be at thoracic vertebrae 6 to 9. Secure the catheter with a purse string suture. Avoid puncturing the catheter, the vessels, or the skin. There are several stages at which you may encounter difficulty with insertion. If the catheter threads to only 3 centimeters, the umbilical tie may be too tight. Loosen the tie, redilate the vessel, and reinsert. If insertion is easy but there is no blood return, or if you sense a pop after entering the lumen, the catheter may be in a false track outside the vessel. Remove the catheter and prepare the other umbilical artery for insertion. If you encounter resistance at 6 to 8 centimeters in a full-term infant, the catheter may be at the curvature in the umbilical artery, curving around the bladder before it enters the internal iliac artery. 
Apply gentle pressure for 30 seconds. Some experts recommend positioning the infant on the side with the artery being cannulated in the superior position, flexing the hip to facilitate insertion. In our experience, it is often best to move on to the second artery if resistance is encountered at this curvature. To insert an umbilical vein catheter, with your non-dominant hand, grasp the cord with the tooth forceps. With your dominant hand, using the mosquito forceps, remove any blood clots from the entrance of the vein. Using the mosquito forceps, introduce the pre-flushed venous catheter attached to the stopcock and syringe into the lumen of the vein and insert 3 centimeters. Gently pull back on the syringe to ensure blood return and proper placement. If blood returns, continue inserting the catheter to the predetermined depth. Obtain radiographic or ultrasonographic confirmation of the catheter position. The ideal position is in the inferior vena cava, near the right atrium. Secure the catheter as you did for the arterial catheter. If the catheter meets resistance before it reaches the predetermined distance, it has most likely entered the portal system, become wedged in an intrahepatic branch of the umbilical vein, or doubled back on itself. In these circumstances, pull the catheter out of the vein approximately 4 centimeters and rotate the catheter as you reinsert it into the vein. Occasionally, this will allow the tip to slip through the ductus venosus. Often, it is necessary to repeat this maneuver several times. During an extensive resuscitation, it may be necessary to obtain emergent intravenous access. Immediately following birth, the umbilical vein is the vessel of choice. The procedure is altered slightly from what has been previously described. Prepare the umbilical cord with an antiseptic solution. It is often impossible to create a sterile field in an emergency situation. The operator should don sterile gloves and keep the catheter as sterile as possible. The catheter must be pre-flushed and attached to a stopcock and syringe. If an assistant isn't available, you can tie the cord at the base with a cord tie and cut the umbilical cord two centimeters above the skin. Quickly insert the umbilical venous catheter into the umbilical vein to a depth of three to five centimeters below the skin. In a full-term infant, check for blood return and secure the catheter between your fingers or with tape. It is imperative that the catheter not be inserted too deeply, as it may enter the hepatic vessels, in which medications administered during the urgent situation could potentially cause hepatocellular damage. To prevent clot formation, keep the catheter free of blood by flushing it with 0.5 milliliters of solution each time blood is drawn from the catheter. Solution should flow continuously through the catheter to prevent retrograde flow. Watch closely for evidence of clot formation, including difficulty withdrawing blood samples or decreased amplitude of pulse pressure on a blood pressure tracing. If a clot forms, do not attempt to flush the clot forcibly. Unless the line is critical, it should be removed. UACs can cause or be associated with multiple complications, including but not limited to thrombosis, embolism, vasospasm, loss of extremity, hypertension, air embolism, necrotizing intercolitis, infection, and bladder injury. If malpositioned, these catheters can result in vessel perforation, refractory hypoglycemia, peritoneal perforation, and sciatic nerve palsy. Complications associated with UVCs include infection, thromboembolism, perforation of the peritoneum, portal hypertension, digital ischemia, and pneumopericardium. When placed in the wrong position, UVCs can cause pericardial effusion and tamponade and cardiac arrhythmias. Umbilical catheters should be removed when complications occur. The length of time an uncomplicated catheter may remain in place is the subject of some controversy. At present, we recommend strict adherence to individual institutional policies until consensus on this important issue can be obtained. The placement of umbilical catheters is an indispensable technique used to stabilize the condition of critically ill newborns. Proper insertion technique and knowledge of potential complications will improve the utility of these catheters in the newborn population.